Welcome after the, after the break. And uh, today we'll uh, start uh, talking about making our Python applications more complex. In the first hour, we will talk about databases, and the second hour, we'll talk about uh, web technologies. Um, so the first uh, goal here is uh, to be able to handle per persistency in our applications, in our Python applications. Uh, what happens is that uh, whenever you restart your application, you need to stop it and start again, or restart your computer, and all the information that is, uh, say, in memory gets lost, of course. And uh, uh, so from one side, uh, we want to handle persistence of, of information, making, when, when, once I save some information, I don't want to lose it. Hmm? Up to now, the only way we used uh, to, to make some information persistent is to save that into some file. We saved the to-do list into a text file that we were able to read it again the next time. Uh, we saved the MP3 file, the, the audio uh, uh, version, uh, onto an MP3 file that we read afterwards because we needed it and so on. So we uh, used, the, quite naturally, the file system as a persistent layer. There are two problems in, uh, in, in using files, especially text files, you know, for storing information. Uh, the first is the files are okay for saving information, not much for processing information. Hey, imagine you have uh, all the information in a text file, you want to delete one line in the middle. There's no operation for doing that. You need to rewrite another file with the, that line omitted and it takes a lot of time, it's slow and it's complex to manage. Hmm? Um, so they lead themselves to uh, store information, the results of some computing, but not to be, uh, let's say, a, um, a repository of information that it gets elaborated and uh, managed by the, by the computer. Uh, the second issue is that uh, um, when you have complex data to store, uh, then if you are using some text file, then it's up to you to encode this information. Okay, in the to-do list we had the, the, the to-do description and then comma a number that indicates a, a priority. But uh, what happens if the comma is inside the description? Or well, then we can, we can use the quotes. But what happens if the quotes are inside the text and so on? So we need to invent every time new ways of encoding the information. And if I have an image, how to encode that? And if I have a text, uh, a message that goes into many lines, uh, how would we encode them? Everything can be solved, but it makes more complicated saving the file and also much more complicated to reload it again. Hmm? So we don't want to, to, to do it uh, by hand. Uh, the second issue is that uh, if I have information stored in a file, then I need to read the whole content of the file into memory at the beginning of the program, then do all my computation, and at the end we'll save the file. Uh, it's very uh, unlikely that we want to process directly the file on disk. And so if we have a lot of information, big files, then you are using a lot of memory. And maybe the amount of data that you want to manage uh, is larger than the available memory. Especially, okay, don't think about a personal computer. Think about a, a Raspberry uh, Pi, which is, uh, need, needs to handle maybe the measurements of a sensor for uh, taking the last months. So it can have uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of, of measurements. Hmm? And the available memory is just uh, uh, half a gigabyte, so uh, there's, not, there's not much to spare for. Hmm? So we want to be able to let uh, the data live on disk and be able to query it and to change it and to manage it uh, from our program dynamically as we need it, as we want it. Uh, you come, or most of you come from uh, um, a previous course in which you saw the databases. Hmm? And so we saw the uh, language, the SQL language, the structured query language for 
uh, querying databases uh, uh, organized in, uh, in the relational model with tables and columns and so on. And you saw that uh, it's very powerful as language. So you can, once you have the data, it's very easy to uh, just uh, to extract the part that you need. So we know that there are very efficient and powerful databases that exploit the relational model and can be queried with the SQL, SQL language, SQL language. What we need to learn is how to interact with that database from our Python application, okay? So in some way making the data stored in a database also accessible to our program. This is an idea of what we want to achieve. We have a Python application up there and there are some data which is stored into a database. Uh, what does it mean being stored into a database? It means that we have some uh, program, some server, running on the same machine or on a different machine. It may also be in a different place. And this program is managing the data for us. We call that the, uh, the database server. The servers, one of the, one of the most famous ones, because it's free, because it's uh, small, because quite, say, honestly fast, uh, is MySQL. Okay, so imagine you have one server, one computer in which you have installed the MySQL server database. This database engine, uh, the, the correct name would be a RDMS, Relational Database Management System, the system for managing databases, is able to manage databases. So each database is a set of tables containing a set of records each. Uh, we, we don't care about how this information is stored into files, into the file system. We only care that it's being correctly managed and efficiently managed by this SQL server layer. So whenever we want to, to query some information, to add new data, to delete something, to update something, we ask the SQL server to do that using the SQL language. So what we want to do now to understand is how to, let's say, create this link between these two words. So we assume that on our computer, we have a database server that will manage all the data for us. Uh, for example, uh, we can use uh, the MySQL database, which is, as I said, open source, is complete, uh, and uh, the only issue is that it runs uh, as a separate process. So it's a service that runs on your machine. You need to have it installed, and you have to start it at the beginning, now with administration password and so on. It's a service that runs on your machine. Your Python program needs to connect to that service on the machine. Hmm? Uh, it may be on the same machine, it may also be in a different machine. If the connection is over the internet, the local network usually, so it may be over the local host, uh, internal network, or any other machine accessible on the, on the local network. The good part is that uh, since it's a server open for connections from different applications, it's not a problem if you, if you have different applications that concurrently try to access the same data. So all the issues about consistency of the data, what happens when two different applications try to write the same date, the same file, or the same uh, table, are solved automatically by, by the SQL Server. So we have a powerful tool that is able to do its job well. Manage data. In some cases, it can be too heavy or too complex to have an architecture like the one suggested by MySQL with a different server running on a machine that you want to query. Uh, this is good if you have a lot of data, if data is structured, if you need to do complex queries. But in, in other cases, you, you might just need something simpler. You just have a, not much data, just some information, and the queries you do are very simple, and you want to simplify everything. And maybe you don't need, or you don't want to have another, just to install a new server, just to manage a handful of data. So there's an option for that, and it's a very well-known library called SQLite. Okay? SQLite is not a server. It's just a library. 
a library that you can include in your program and uh, is able to read and write files directly from within your program, okay? So it's a sort of, imagine that there's a sort of a powerful file library which gives you file operations on files, and but these files, uh, is this, so this library is able to understand also some of the SQL queries. It doesn't understand the full SQL language, but the most common, uh, say, operations can be done. What is the advantage? Is that you don't need anything on your system to use a, a SQLite uh, um, database. Just uh, include this library in Python, we will say, we include the module SQLite, and just use it, and uh, the SQLite library will uh, manage one big, be small or big, just one single binary file in the location that you want, and we store your data inside. So you don't need any additional tool, any additional service installed in your computer. Of course, it's a file managed by an application, so it's not uh, advisable to try to access it concurrently. There are some provisions for concurrent access, but it's better to avoid that. It's not uh, um, advisable for heavy duty operation if you have a lot of, um, of data, then it gets, uh, this library is not very efficient, cannot, doesn't have the intelligence uh, for optimizing the queries in the best way for exploiting indexes uh, in, in, um, in, in the tables, foreign keys, and all, all, all like that, or stuff like that. For that, you, you would need a real database. But if you don't have a lot of data, you want something fast. You don't want something that doesn't have any dependency on other services on that machine, uh, you can use this from the same Python application. So the second question is how to create this link how to use uh, the SQLite library from your Python application. Um, so the main advantage is that this is self-contained. Another advantage that I could mention that I didn't write here in the slide is that uh, SQLite is not a Python-specific library. Actually, it starts as a, as a C library for the C language. But then you have uh, the SQLite library in every language you can imagine. You can access SQLite from C, from C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Python, Ruby, uh, Perl, whatever you like, okay? And they are all binary compatible. So the different programs can read the same SQLite database if they, are, of course, use the, the right version of the, of the SQLite libraries. So it's cross-platform uh, and the self-contained solution. Uh, so are we talking about one or two databases today? Hmm. Actually, uh, the designers of Python came up with a nice uh, idea of defining a, an abstraction of databases. Say, so, okay, I have MySQL, I might have uh, Postgres, I might have Oracle, I might have uh, MariaDB, my, my, there are many different SQL server SQL databases, relational databases that understand SQL. There is SQLite, but there may be also other uh, libraries. So instead of uh, creating a different uh, library or a different way of connecting with each of different database type, they defined a standard API. Say, okay, for People that want to integrate databases, for people who want to write the libraries, the Python library for accessing the data, these databases, try to use or to provide an API, a set of functions, which is conforming to this specification, this PEP 249. Okay, so what happens is that if we learn this general specification, then we are, we are automatically able to connect with any kind of database. Because all the, let's say, well-written libraries will conform to this specification. Of course, there will be details. There are always details. Huh? The devil lies in the, detail, in the details. So uh, some operation which works on a database will not work ex in exactly the same way on the other. But the general picture should be the same. Hmm? We should be able to change our 
uh, database implementation to switch from MySQL to SQLite with just one line of code, even in a, in a large prop. Hmm? That's our, our goal. So what we do is first we learn how a Python application may work on this uh, uh, database, abstraction, abstracted programming interface, and then we see how to concretely, let's say, uh, this API can talk and can implement these two connections. If you see, these are still dashed lines, so there's something that we still don't know at this level, but this is a full line. Uh, so it means that actually it's already the code that we can write uh, to, uh, to use these functions. Actually, to make full lines below, we need uh, to uh, have additional modules, additional libraries. Uh, uh, if we want to talk with MySQL, we need to install MySQL in our Linux server or Windows server or on our Raspberry or whatever. And then we need a, a Python module that implements this interface. And this Python module is called uh, MySQL Connector. It can be downloaded by the MySQL website. It's a, it's a Python library that implements these functions. So on one hand, it implements this API. On the other hand, it knows how to talk, how to speak with the MySQL database. So it bridges the two. The same for SQLite. SQLite is a binary C library, and it needs a Python module to expose the functions provided by the SQLite native code library into Python methods, Python functions, that are conforming to this API. So we learn how to program the API, and then we remember to import, uh, to install the right modules, the SQL connector or the SQLite a module depending on the database that we actually want to connect to. This just will be just an import statement. Hmm? What we learned today hmm, will also be used uh, next week uh, when we start uh, talking about uh, building web applications with Python. So right now we are just building standalone application that we can run from the console or from the PyCharms. Next week, we'll start uh, learning about how to create web dynamic websites or web, web applications, and it will be the same. So it will be a different ways of creating applications, but it will always be Python, and we will still use uh, PEP249 to access the database. We'll see that uh, uh, storing information in the database is much more important for a web application than for a normal application because of the way a web application works. So for every new page or for every new request, it starts from scratch. But we'll talk about that starting from the next hour. Okay, um, you may know or you may listen that there are many other databases available. One uh, which is very quite famous today is called MariaDB or MariaDB, depends on how, how you want to, to read it which is actually a fork of MySQL. So what happened is that the developers of MySQL at a given point in time were not happy about how the MySQL project was managed, basically from the Oracle Corporation that owned the, the rights to the code. And so they decided to take a copy of the source code and develop it independently on their own. And they called it MariaDB. Today, all the Linux uh, distributions uh, have a package which is called MySQL, but internally, actually, it, has, it is a MariaDB implementation. So if you, if you see the process, it's called, still called MySQL D, MySQL daemon, but actually it's, uh, the, the, the source code comes from the MariaDB project. So actually, they are, the two are 98% interchangeable. Uh, MariaDB only is, is improved in some aspects, uh, and MySQL is being somewhat abandoned by the open source community as being supported only by, by Oracle. But the two are the same for us. And the, con the Python connector for MySQL works perfectly with MariaDB, so we don't see the difference. 
Uh, if you want uh, a um, database which is uh, more complete from the relational point of view, mm, triggers, uh, transactions, and so on, uh, you, you may also have a look at Postgres, which is a bit more complex, but uh, more conforming to the SQL standard, especially the advanced uh, features of the SQL standard, rather than MySQL. So it's again a different server. These are more or less the options that you find. There is also a whole world of so-called non-relational databases. You may have heard the NoSQL keyword, saying databases that don't work in the relational model, don't work in SQL with SQL queries. Uh, we, do, we, we won't consider them here. In many cases, they are used because they are easy to implement, uh, they are fast and uh, so on, but we, we don't have time also to go mm, to, in that way here. Mm. So we, we will only limit uh, uh, to um, relational databases, SQL databases. Okay, about PEP uh, 249. Now, all the PEPs are the specifications, the Python specifications. Uh, the name, uh, so a lot of uh, Python libraries, interfaces, standards are described not in the official Python language reference guide, but rather in a PEP or PEP. Uh, PEP, PEP uh, for Python enhancement proposal. So somebody that proposes how to enhance, improve in some way the Python libraries. And in particular, this 249 is the Python database API specification, hmm? uh, which is the current version, 249, that uh, replaces version 248, uh, that was uh, the version 1.0. So currently, uh, it's, uh, it's not a very long or complex specification, just uh, three or four pages, that describes what are the types of uh, Python classes to be used for connecting to a database. Hmm? So all the Python modules that want to provide you access to databases, so the Python module for MySQL, the Python connector, or the Python library for SQLite, must, not must, should implement the same types of functions, the same types of classes, the same interface. Hmm? So this PEP doesn't provide a library, nor a module, nothing, okay? They say, okay, if you want to, all the modules that provide database access should implement this interface. And then it's up, of course, to the implementer of the mo these modules to, to do that, uh, to, um, to be compliant, uh, to comply with this kind of specification. But it happens. Hmm? Third party modules may, or we hope, they adhere to this specification. Uh, so what are the main concepts? It's, it's actually a small library, a small set of classes. There are two main objects. One is a, the, a connection class, and the other is a cursor class. Connection and cursor. Um, you can imagine, at least I imagine, a connection as a pipe. A pipe that connects your application with the database. So first of all, to exchange information, you must establish a pipe, open a connection. Then you can send shuttles of information back and forth inside this pipe through this connection. Okay? Uh, these uh, pieces of information that go back and forth from your application to the database through the pipe, pardon, through the connection, uh, are called uh, cursors. A cursor is something that goes above and below, up and down, back and forth, between different places. A cursor is uh, uh, an object that manages the execution of a query. You may have uh, uh, two different types of uh, queries from your application to the database. The most common ones are queries for retrieving information. The data is there. I want to know the to-do list of the last three days, for example. 
So I can write uh, in SQL a select statement. Select uh, to do uh, comma urgent from uh, tasks where date uh, less than or uh, greater than three years ago, three days ago. So I have a query that when is, this query is run by the database, delivers some results. Okay, so in this case, the cursor lets us uh, retrieve these results. So we put the query inside the cursor, we say to the cursor, please execute this query, the cursor goes to the database, lets the query execute, and comes back with the result. And from the same cursor, we can fetch or extract the results and use them in our program for printing, for sorting, for what you, for speaking out or whatever. So this is the first case in which we have uh, queries for getting information. There's a second case, queries for modifying data. Um, there are three, no better, two instructions in SQL in the SQL language to modify data. Insert, insert into table, values, such and such, and update. Hmm? Update, uh, set a column to three where uh, another field is uh, greater than 10. Uh, two statements for modifying data. There are actually three. The third one is delete. I don't use it. I never use delete in a program. Never delete your data. Never, ever. You might need it later, always. So forget about the delete statement, unless you are trying to clean up everything and start from scratch. No, you, you delete the, the data in the debug session or whatever. But in normal cases, data gets never deleted from a database. Okay. Um, and so in that case, hmm? sorry, in that in the second case, uh, the cursor is only used to send the data to modify, and of course it doesn't bring back anything, because there are, they, these are instructions for insert and update for modifying data. There's no result to return. So actually the cursor is only one way to go. It doesn't need to go, to, to come back with any kind of result. So it, they are simpler. Of course, they will behave in a different way. Okay, but let's uh, focus on a, on a simple case. Uh, usually, this is a minimal example of an actual code that you could write in order to execute a, a query on a database. Imagine this query written in green colors, any kind of query. We, we will try to do some uh, uh, some query of, uh, of our own. Uh, we need uh, actually six steps. Okay, five, because the sixth one actually returns the result. Preparing the query, opening the connection, executing the query, so creating the cursor and executing the query, getting the results, and closing the connection. So once you open the pipe, you use it for one or more queries, and then you close the pipe to free the resources on the database side, so that the, 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 you disconnect from the database, and the database knows that you are no longer connected and can free its own internal memory for efficiency. Okay? This, this set the, all steps is always the same. In, a, in every case. So let's go uh, one by one through all the steps. Uh, by the way, we should notice that the only step number two is the one where you see some dependency on the database. The first line is a query in SQL language. Every relational database will be able to understand that query. There's no specific dependency on MySQL versus SQLite versus, versus Postgres. The only that are line number two holds a MySQL dot something uh, um, name, package name here. 
So this is the only point where we need to change something if we modify, if we decide to change database. All the rest will be identical. Mm. This is the, the good point about uh, having a uniform API. Mm. Okay, um, step one, defining the query. We must know what we want to do with our data. So to extract some information from a table, join two table during some comparison. Hmm? I won't repeat here say what uh, you've learned in a database course. Huh? Um, but we need, we need to know SQL language for writing the query. Or we need to modify the database. So if we need to modify, we'll use an insert, for example, or an update statement instead of a select one. There are two cases. In the first case, the query is just a static string. It's always like that, like in the first case. In other cases, the query may be dynamic. So the, some of the parameters, some of the uh, values inside the query may change. In an insert, of course, they will always change. Also in a select statement, if I have a where clause, where user equal my name. So uh, there is a, a part of the query that is dependent on some information that the program will only get dynamically while running. So in this case, uh, we replace the variable part of the query with this placeholder. Percentage S stands for string. So a string, another string. So this is not technically a query, it's more of a query template. <laughs> a template for building the actual queries. The, having these templates will save us a lot of work of escaping special characters and a lot of nesting uh, problems, nasty problems that other languages always have. Okay, so we understand which query we want, we understand which are the parameters, the variable parts of this query, and replace them with percentage uh, placeholders. And then once we have the query, we connect to the database. Connecting to the database <coughs> requires calling a method called connect from the connector class of the package that depends on the database that we want to use. So mysql.connector.connect. If we want to open a new connection with a MySQL database. Or we can imagine sqlite.connector.connect if we want to open a connection with a SQLite file. So the name of the package implementing the connector dot connector, which is the name of the, let's go back, of the connection object, dot connect, which is the method that actually opens the connection. What you get in return is a connection object. The parameters of the connect method are non-standard. There is no standard. Every database has a different set of parameters. The, every database has a different way of connecting. Uh, for example, for MySQL, you need to provide a host. So wh which is the host in which the database is running, for example, localhost. The authentication, user and password that you need to connect to the database server, and the database that holds the, the information that you want, because a, a single instance of, of MySQL may contain or may manage many different databases. So which one is the, the current database? In the case of uh, SQLite, uh, it's much simpler. We, we just need a, a file name, the name of the file where to store the information. So we don't need any host information, user information, and so on, just the file name. So all the parameters to connect are different. So what you should be prepared 
to change if you want to change databases is of course to change the module, the Python module, and the parameters to the connect method. This, uh, there's no effort for standardizing that, those. Okay, so we have, uh, we know which query we want to run. We create a new connection, a new pipe that will be used to send the query. Step number two. Fast forward to step number five. So after two, why do we put five? Uh, not to forget it. So uh, just remember, after you write connect, write close, so that you don't forget it later. So one mistake in a program is to open a connection and forget to close it. So if you have one method, one function in your program that opens a connection, runs some query, and doesn't close the connection, every time you call this function, you will open a new connection and the old ones will stay open until the database just stops you saying, okay, I run out of available connection because there's a, a, a maximum number of simultaneous connections that the database can handle. They will be mostly idle connection, abandoned ones, but the database doesn't know it. Knows that somebody opened the connection, didn't close it, so potentially some new query may arrive on those old abandoned connections. So uh, not to forget it, because otherwise you will have a program that, is, that runs, but after maybe two minutes stops and starts uh, giving you database errors, and you don't understand why. In many cases, just because you forgot to close, to free resources, to close the connections, and you're running out of resources on the database server. So my suggestion is, as long as you close, just put an automatic trigger into your hand and write, uh, as long as you write connect, also write close. Hmm? Closing the connection. Yeah? Would you recommend to use a single pipe for a single query, or can you use a single pipe for more than one query? The second one. So the question was uh, whether a single connection can be used for only one query or, or if the same connection can be used for many different queries. The answer is the second one. So the single connection, once it's open, it stays available for as long as you want. And you can create many different uh, uh, cursors, so many different queries on the same connection. When you don't need the connection anymore, you close it and you shut it down. So one possible user pattern is to open a connection at the beginning of your program and then close it at the end of the program. And so you have a sort of a global connection shared by all the different uh, functions. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's one possibility. It's, uh, it may have its problem because if some uh, different parts of the program uh, uh, start if you have a uh, to say query that read some data and then modify it, and then in between there is some other uh, function that needs to run another query, then you don't have uh, actually the integrity of the of the transactions. And what about if we are if we are reading different tables? It is recommended to open different no. tables or just one. Uh, so the question was about uh, how many queries you need if you want to read uh, different tables. Uh, it doesn't matter. Actually, the question is not which table do I want to read, is which data do I, do I need to use. So I may have one query that joins four different tables and creates one uh, set of results, and that's one query. And uh, I use that query until I, I, I finish working with the, the, those results. Um, it, uh, we have on one side. So uh, every kind of SQL query I throw at the database, it runs it. It's up to me whether to keep many queries open because maybe I need one result from the first one and one result for the second one, so I don't want to read all of them, all of the first one before running the second. I'm just asking the database to keep two, two result sets open. Hmm? But uh, it's a job, it's all, uh, uh, let's, let me say, one mistake that we do too often as programmers and not as database administrators 
is uh, that we want to do all the work. So we want to get the data and do all the computations. And in many cases, the database is more efficient than us. If, we, if you start having, for example, two collections, two lists, or one dictionary and a list, and you want to know whether the element in a list is contained in the key of the dictionary, or more than once, or something complex, and you start writing code and nested loops, uh, and you start getting lost in that. Hmm? If you try to write the same thing as a querying SQL, it will come out nice, and it will, uh, it will give you the right result, uh, will manage the null values, all the, all the details. Hmm? So don't be, don't be afraid of running queries. Just free the resources when you don't need them anymore. Okay, so step one and two, remember to close. And then let's go to the actual query execution. Hmm? So we have a connection, and the connection can give us as many cursors as we want. So each time we call the cursor method on the connection object, it gives, you, it gives me a new cursor object. And that cursor will be used for one query. I need to manage two queries at the same time, I just get two cursors, one for each query, on the same connection, from the same connection. It's the connection that gives me the, that's why I imagine them as little shuttles that go up and down on the, on the pipe. And so uh, the query, the cursor, has one method called execute that takes as a parameter the string containing the SQL command. The Python interpreter doesn't understand SQL, of course. It treats it just like a string of text. The string is taken from the Python code and sent directly to the database, and only there the SQL will be understood. So if you have a syntax error in your query, you will uh, we, um, get the error only when you try to execute the query. The Python code doesn't understand it. Only the, and the, the error will come not from the database, sorry, not from the program, not from the Python code, but from the database. You will have a lot of different Python exceptions of type database exception. So an exception coming from the database. In the, uh, the first form execute SQL, is for queries that don't have parameters, like this one. I don't have any parameter. But if I had uh, some parameters to insert into the string, I can use the second format, string, so the execute method by passing the SQL string, and then a tuple with all the parameters. Okay, you know what tuple is, it's a sort of a list, but uh, in, uh, in, uh, we, without, in, with the, 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 the round parentheses instead of the square brackets. Um, and the difference between a tuple and a list, the main difference is that a tuple is uh, unmodifiable. Huh? You cannot add or remove anything from a tuple, so it's something that is, is used to create uh, uh, batches or, of information that never changes after it's created, of course. When you create it, you can put the information you want, then it doesn't change anymore. Um, so in this case, uh, the, the string had two parameters, uh, text before and text after, for example, and we are here providing the actual values to substitute from those parameters. So this text before would be, would be string ABC, and this string ABC will be replaced in place of the first placeholder with the proper quoting. So in SQL, you will need to you need to write open parenthesis, single quote, ABC, closing quote, comma, and etc. The quotes are inserted automatically. You don't need to provide them. Okay, and the same if the text here, the string here contains a quote character, then in SQL you need to put it twice to escape it. If it contains a new line, 
then in SQL you need to have a backslash, and so on. There's a lot of escaping uh, for representing into the SQL language special characters. You don't need to worry about any of this. Okay, so all the quoting and substitution and escaping is done by the execute method. You just provide a variable here and it will be formatted correctly, right? Which is really a time saver compared with PHP if you know it. Um, there is just one special case. When you have one, just one parameter in the query, so not two, but only one, so imagine not having the second one here, how uh, you need the second parameter, the second argument to execute should always be a tuple. But if you put a single variable inside parentheses, this parentheses, so open parentheses three, closing parentheses, doesn't, doesn't create a tuple. It just creates the number three, like an expression. Right? You put, it's a, a pair of redundant parentheses. They just get ignored. So if you want to create a tuple with one element, you need to provide a trailing comma here. Okay, so the, having this comma creates a, a one tuple with one element that is a string, instead of having just one string. So just get used to that. It's not a typo, but it's actually a need. I need the, I needed the syntax. Okay, so executing a query with parameters means uh, calling the execute method on the cursor. Just imagine the execute method taking the query template, SQL string, taking the actual values of the parameters, so all the elements of the tuple, doing the substitution, so having transforming the query template into an actual query with current values of the parameters, and sending the query to the database and waiting for the database to complete the operation. If everything goes right, if we don't have any syntax errors or, or anything else wrong in the, in the query. When the query completes, the cursor comes back and gives us methods to retrieve the result. So here we split the discussion. Did we use a select statement? for getting results, or did we use an insert update statement for modifying the database? Because things get different at this point. If we use a select for getting data, there are various methods of the cursor object for fetching the results. Fetch one is a method that gives you the next result. So uh, just remember, a SQL query creates a table as a result, okay? Many col as many columns as you specify in your select, for example, here you will create uh, one table with one, two, and three columns, and as many rows as needed uh, that are currently matching the query, the conditions. Okay, so the result of a query is always a table. Fetch one gives you the next row of this table until there are no remaining rows, and then it gives you the, the none object. Huh? It's the null in, uh, in, uh, in Python. Otherwise, so every row will be a collection, a list, for example. But it depends on the implementation. You know that it's a collection that you can iterate. It can be, usually it's a list. It's not a dictionary. So you don't index by column name. You index by position, first, second, third, fourth column, zero, one, two, three, four. Um, if you want the next row, if you want the, all the table, you can call the fetch all that gives you a collection of collections. Hmm? A collection, a big collection with one entry for each row, and each entry is a collection with one entry for each column. <laughs> um, and uh, these are not the only methods. If you go to the PEPS documentation, you see that all the methods for cursor, okay, you, we already know execute. 
uh, well, execute many may be used if you have the same statement to execute uh, with many different data. So we will provide a list of tuples and say, so it will execute the query many times with the, with the diff, each time applying a different current tuple for the data. But then we have the fetch one, fetch all, and in between we have fetch many, which is like uh, fetch all, but with a maximum size. So fetch uh, at most 20 results. Maybe the results are 10,000. We don't know to fetch all them. It will just slow down our program. If we want only to display the first 20, it's better to fetch only 20. Uh, and well, there are other methods which are less used. So basically, these are these three fetch methods for getting Python variables corresponding to the results of the query. This if the query was a select. If the query was an update or insert, uh, two different things happen. The first is that you don't, you don't have any result to fetch. There's nothing to fetch. So you don't need to do it. Second is that the update might be delayed. So the database might keep note that the data should be inserted or should be modified, but maybe may for efficiency, for effi uh, internal efficiency reasons, it decides not to apply that immediately, to keep that waiting. So you are just sort of lining up, queuing some modifications, and the modification will be done actually only when you call the commit method on the connection. So you're sending a lot of small queries. The queries are all lined up in the server. Server, And when, when you commit the, the connection, when you call the commit method connection, then the library will tell the database, uh, now execute them. It's usually more, for example, if you need to insert 20 different items, it's, it's usually more efficient for the database to do all the insert in a row, immediately one after the other, rather than one at a time. Do one statement, return back, do another statement, return back, and so on. So for efficiency reasons, every time you need to insert or update or do, not delete, so let's forget about delete, insert or update some data, remember to call the commit method. If it's only that query that you want, you, you may commit it immediately. If you are planning to do a set of related queries in a short period of time, you can line up all the queries and then commit at the end before doing other select queries, because the, the next select would, would like to see the modified data. And in any case, remember to call it before closing the connection. Okay, so this small, uh, say, housekeeping work to do on the connection, remember to explicitly commit the connection. And then uh, we have the cleanup. We close the connection, but we may also explicitly close the cursor. So if we want to keep the connection open because we need to run other queries, but we don't need the results of this specific query anymore, because maybe we already printed it or we already copied it to another data structure, then we can free the results, of, free the query, destroy the cursor. And it, the destroying the cursor has some little impact on this Python side, so you are deleting one variable. Uh, it has uh, more impact on the database side because maybe the query used a lot of indexes in the in the in the query optimization, so it it's uh, let's say using some memory space in the database server. So closing the the, the query um, say tells to the database server to say free the resource. Okay, and after that you can do whatever you want with the data. Uh, and if you need other queries, you can go back to reusing the same connection and getting new cursors. So this is quite 
the same steps over and over again. OK, so if you want to test part of this practically. So let's, let's try to do it, uh, for example, first with MySQL. You remember the exercise that we had uh, in the last lab about the to-do list. So let's try to write some pieces of code uh, where we, we try to read and write not from a file, but from a database. So first of all, what do we need? We need uh, MySQL. MySQL, uh, we, you need uh, well, uh, to download if you are on Windows or Mac from the MySQL website or MariaDB website, uh, the two distributions. If you are under uh, Ubuntu or Linux, you just need to um, apt get install MySQL server. This is the name of the package. This will install and run the database server. Then you need to download the MySQL connector from Python. So it's a small installer that uh, provides you this package, MySQL connector, adds it to the Python library, to your Python library. Okay, so these are the links. Uh, the Python connector can be downloaded from this from this page. But we are not doing it uh, right now. So uh, the Python connector comes with the, with a lot of documentation. So you say that this is my SQL connector Python developer guide is actually there's a lot of information. What what we need uh, at the beginning is of course. Uh, what is the format for the connect method? We say that connect is non-standard and every database vendor is free to implement different arguments. So what are the arguments that you need to provide when connected to MySQL? Okay, the arguments are listed in this table. A lot of them are available. The most important ones are the beginning. User, password, database, host. And the port, if you are not running it on a, on a standard port, the standard port for MySQL is 3306. Hmm? So these are the five most used parameters, and the others are for advanced usage. So what I did uh, is uh, I already installed, I'm on Windows, but nothing changes at this point, uh, um, uh, MariaDB in, on this computer. So if we see in the services, of this computer, you see that I have a service called MySQL, and you see that this is the MariaDB database server. So actually, it's MariaDB installed that calls itself MySQL for compatibility reasons, and it's running. Okay, this is on, on Windows. On Linux, you would do ser sudo service start MySQL. Hmm? or service status MySQL to check whether it's uh, uh, running or not. So it's running. So we may try to connect and to see something. Uh, in uh, On Windows, there's this nice program which is called uh, Heidi SQL, or like this, Heidi SQL, which is a small uh, graphical interface for connecting to MySQL. So I connect, open a connection, provide the password, and they see all the databases that are configured on this server or localhost, so on, the, on my computer. We want to store the to-do list so we can create a new database containing one or more tables. So the database could be called the to-do list. And this database right now doesn't have any tables in it. We can create a new table that we may call the task table. And the task is composed of a to-do description and an urgent field, yes or no. So I create one task table with, okay, let's put also an ID 
because in database it's always nice to have a primary key hmm? and uh, um, to do a text and uh, an urgent field. We define the data type. The DASD is an, a number that uh, automatically auto increments so that it will be automatically generated and we want to make it a primary key. So you see the little key, green, uh, yellow key here. The to do is a string, so in my in SQL language is a variable charters uh, sequence of maybe 200 characters maximum, not null. And the urgent field is an integer, okay, uh, not null. So this is nothing more than a nice graphical interface for editing this, the create code. What we did actually is clicking on, uh, on, on windows, on, on, uh, on, on menus and so, for creating this text. Right now, we, the database, the table is not yet created. I only prepared this, which is the SQL statement for creating the table. If we don't have, uh, if we didn't have this uh, graphical user interface, you, we could have written, because we all know SQL, we could have written that statement badly. But I'm lazy, so I let the program do it. If I do save, that statement is executed, you, you see here, create table, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in this, this window below, you have the log of all the queries that Heidi exchanges with the database. Heidi is no, is no different from any other client application. Okay, and we have this table called task. You can also have a look at some data. So we can insert some data. Insert to do by the milk. Milk. Urgent, yes. And we may also have another, you see when I click, uh, it will write insert into to-do list task values by the milk one. And it run, runs the instruction. And another one can be past exam, which is not urgent. We still have time. And so on, just for playing with that. And another one which is uh, uh, I don't know, um, go for a walk. And especially in these classes, it's urgent to do that. So imagine people have, have entered this set of information. And we want to query or to print the list of urgent tasks to do. So what can we write? We can write with a database, select to do from task where urgent is one, right? And if I run this query, I get the result. If I also want to see the ID column, I can write ID and to do. And so I get a table with two items, two rows and two columns, and so on. Okay? Okay, right now this is just playing with SQL. How to do how to run this query, sorry, from our Python program. Okay? So let's open a Python project. Uh, create a new project. <laughs> Let's call it uh, um, to the list database, DB. Hmm? 
create. It will not be the, the complete project, but okay, so we can start a new Python file called uh, to do. Okay, now it's empty. So what we wanted to do is uh, to execute that query in our program and to see the results. Very simple. So we just follow the steps. First of all, we need to, we, we, we know that we want to use uh, uh, MySQL, so we import MySQL, the MySQL package. Uh, the import goes, doesn't give any error because I, I first installed the, the Python connector uh, from the page, the web page that I shown before. Okay, you need first to download and install the Python connector. Sorry, from this web page. Oh, sorry. Where is the? Okay, so let's start with the program. With name equal main. Um, we first to open a, con a con uh, to define the query. So we need to write here the query that we want to execute. I'm lazy, I take this one. I always try to run the queries in an interactive mode before putting them into a program so that I'm sure about the syntax uh, that is working correctly and so on. So it saves me a lot of trouble. Of course, we need to be careful. Okay, this is our, our query. Um, then for executing then that we first open a connection, MySQL dot MySQL dot connector dot connector and then we provide the parameters that are which host run the database, localhost, which is the user the user is root in this case because I didn't bother about creating other users. The password password or pass. Let me just check password try like this. Word is uh, again root. Sorry, I show the password to everybody. And then the database database is the name of the argument. Base is which is the name of the database we created. The name was to do list. Or the database, not the table. To do list. So this should be should create us if everything goes right a connection to the database, to that specific database. <laughs> Remember, not to forget to close it. So let's write a close statement right now. So let's try also to run this program, just to check whether the connection. In fact, there is a, it's not connector, but it's connection force, maybe. Connection. Okay. Connect my seat with connector or connect. Oh, 
okay, sorry. I needed to import the connector packet, not just the connector module, not just my, the MySQL package. Hmm? So mysql.connector.connector with all the parameters. I don't have any errors. That means that probably the connection, the connection will open and then immediately closed. I can check it if I just modify the password. I should get, and I do get an error. And the error is uh, here at the bottom, programming error, thank you. Access denied for user root at localhost using password, yes. So with this user, the password that they provided is wrong because it was denied access. This was easy. Okay, right now we can try to run the query. So I say um, we they get a cursor from the connection. And then we try to execute the, the, the query. Okay, if I try to run it, it should work now. But if I put a syntax error in the query, I will get another programming error exception, which is not very useful. You have an error in your SQL syntax. Check the manual that corresponds to your MariaDB server version for the right syntax near, and it tells you the fragment of the statement that wasn't understood correctly. So you should be prepared to have a lot of SQL ex um, Python exception, but in the bottom line, you have the message coming. This message from this point up to the end comes directly from the database, not from the Python libraries. Okay, so everything is running and the database is involved here. The only thing we, don't, we are not doing here yet is to get in the results. So in this case, we can have the results. We know they are small, so they are um, cursor, fetch, all. And then let's print them. Now, it's not, it's not nice to read, but you see that you have a list square brackets, containing two tuples, round brackets, one for each row. So if you want to print it more nicely, of course you need to walk to the collection of results. So you may have um, four row in results. You may print uh, to do and row one to do by the milk to do go for a walk. Hmm? This uh, first, uh, this um, four statement just unwraps the first level of uh, nesting of the data structure. So I walk through the different lines. And for every line, I call draw. First row is this one, this tuple. The second row is this one, that other tuple. I can extract the different fields. The first field would be the ID, in this case, would be zero. And the second, the string, would be one, and so on. The third is not, doesn't exist here. Okay. So, of course, if we change the query. This is just the main program. We just imagine putting this into a method, a function that gives you the list of uh, of the to dos that you want, and just connect the database and that's the query that you need. If you want to insert, you, you do the same. You just remember. That you you sorry you don't need to fetch anything, but instead of fetch all, you need uh, to do a, a commit. 
Um, do we have uh, five minutes to try uh, SQLite? Yes, we do. We have one hour and a half, so we can uh, still some time, some time for, for the next class. Just to say, let's keep this program as it is and try to do the same exercise but by using SQLite. So first of all, first step, uh, for SQLite, you don't need to install anything. It's just a library into your Python program, okay? Uh, but we want at least to create the table. Again, we could just write a Python program that sends the create statement to SQLite. It's easier if you have a, a graphical user interface, and they use this one, SQLite browser, which is available for Windows, Linux, and, uh, and Mac, so it's a cross-platform, which might, is much simpler, even a bit ugly uh, to see, but it does its work, uh, similar to, to the other ID SQL. And we want to create a database. Creating a database means selecting a file in which the database will be stored. So I can create it under my PyCharm, whatever, projects, to-do list. I can create the to-do list database. So it, it creates, sorry, a to-do list.db file in my project. Right now it's empty. What I can do is create a table called a task. Task with a field, okay, ID is integer, primary key, auto increment. The next one is uh, I replicated the same database, okay? Is the to do text, which is, uh, you see that the, the types in SQLite are much simpler than a real database server. Text, not null. And the third field will be urgent, which is an integer, not null. Okay, and I create the table. If I want, I could see the data and modify it. So I, I wrote, uh, what did I write here? Let's copy. By the mark, urgent yes, new record, and so this is a filter. So new record, by the mark, urgent one, then new record, Some urgency zero, new record, go for a walk, urgency one. Okay, so this is the content of my, I just populated by hand my SQLite file. All the database is inside this to-do list.db in the project directory. So, to do the same, I just need to change a couple of lines. So let me duplicate the file, call it to do, to do light, so that we have the two versions to compare. And the only thing we need to modify is that we need to, impl uh, to import the SQLite 3 package and uh, Call the connect method from SQLite. And the only parameter, so it should be just like this, if I remember correctly. The only parameter that we need is the file name. It's 
So we, you, we import a different package, SQLite, because we need the, the SQLite library instead of the MySQL one, and we change the connect statement. Everything else doesn't change. And if I run this other program, I get an error. No such table task. Why? Task is here. Ah, sorry, write changes. I forgot. Okay. By the mark, go for a walk. Okay, so we didn't see queries with parameters, with placeholders, we didn't see the insert statement, but the skeleton, the template is always the same. And you see how easy it is. So I would suggest for your first experimentation, you're just using SQLite because you don't need to install or configure password or whatever, but then you know, the, it's easy to, to, to migrate your code and also depending on what you need. By the way, there are implementation of uh, SQLite also on Android, so if you want to do something on the mobile, it's, it's easy to do on, on, that, on that case. Okay, so uh, um, next Monday, we have the lab hours, we have the three hours in the lab next Monday, in which you will do two things in parallel. In parallel. First, you will have a couple of exercises you can already imagine trying to migrate the functions of the to-do list with the database functions. Okay, so no longer storing information in a text file. And this will give us also for the future uh, more flexibility to also add the dates, uh, when the date in which uh, the deadline for a task or the date in which it was inserted or the user that is assigned to that will need more complex data types like dates or more tables, a table of users, a table of categories, or whatever. So it's easy to grow. With a text file, it would be impossible or too complex. In parallel with that, we will go group by group and comment with you the result of deliverable number one, which is due at the end of this week. Okay, so there are already 12 groups that have been, whose project has been approved and the uh, say repositories on GitHub have been created already. So you should populate the website. We will look at the website on Sunday and Monday and on Monday afternoon, we can group by group while you're doing your exercises, we can group by group and try to comment with you what is right and what is wrong on your, on your deliverable one. If there is some person that still uh, hasn't uh, an approved project, please hurry up very quickly. Hmm? Okay, let's do a break now and start again in uh, 20 minutes for, for the next topic. Hmm? Thank you.